Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm Scott Miller, and I serve, as you know, each week as your interviewer and host. Today, I am delighted to welcome to the set Sean Acor, a multi-time best-selling author. His TED Talk has over 22 million views. A guest on Oprah's Soul Sunday, he joins a prestigious pantheon of guests, best-selling authors, business titans, CEOs, thought leaders, the occasional celebrity. What they all share in common is a well-deserved, well-vetted point of view on how to become a better leader in your family, in your professional life, in every aspect. Sean Acor, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much for having me. Sean, great to have you. You're coming to us today from Dallas, Texas. Uh, read your book, Cover to Cover, Big Potential, How Transforming the Pursuit of Success Raises Our Achievement, Happiness, and Well-Being. You are a well-recognized author, keynote speaker, interviewer on all things happiness and success. I mean, dude, you've been on Oprah's Soul Sunday. That's enough to warrant you a spot on our program. Delighted you gave us time today, Sean. Oh, thank you so much for letting me join. Hey, looking forward to digging in to your newest book, Big Potential. Before we do that, you know, you're well known as a success author and speaker, written several books on the topic of happiness. How did you leave Harvard, where you did your education, and move into this topic and passion around happiness and success? Well, I fell backwards into this. I was not planning on being a happiness researcher. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I was on a military scholarship, a Navy scholarship to Harvard, and I was uh, planning on being in the Navy, and then I got excited about going to the Divinity School, so I went off to Harvard Business, or Harvard Divinity School to study Christian and Buddhist ethics. And while I was there, while I was learning and asking all these questions about what causes people to wake up in the morning and what causes them to feel meaning in their life, what causes them to, how the lens to which they view the world changes the way that they act in it, some people in the psychology department said, hey, we wanna ask those same questions, we just wanna do it with a scientific lens. And I was like, you can't measure things like happiness, those are a mystery. We can study things like depression or disorder, but you can't study something like happiness. And they said, it's the same scale, we're using the same measures, we're just looking at the other side of the curve. And I got hooked. So I started doing all this research, looking to see what causes people to become happier. And while I was doing this, I became much less happy. I actually went through two years of depression while I was at Harvard in the midst of being in this incredible environment. Um, so what I got to do was to battle test this research, not only in the laboratories, but I got to do it within my own life. And this research not only helped me get out of depression, but it it's the reason <clears throat> that I wanted to do all this work afterwards. It taught me that, if, uh, that not only was depression not the end of the story, but it showed us how much our mindset could have a huge impact upon the ways we act in this world. And I got hooked and started sharing this outside of academia um, and started in the middle of the banking crisis, working with banks, uh, trying to restart forward progress when they lost uh, their economic lever of money. And what we were finding was that this research that worked well in the lab worked even better in the messiness of life. So for now the past 12 years, I've been traveling around researching in companies and schools and shanty towns in South Africa and children's cancer wards to figure out what it is that creates happiness how do we get people to become happier? And then what happens to our business and educational outcomes when that occurs? Well, Sean, you have clearly hit a nerve. The book, Big Potential, captivated me. Read it uh, over the course of a week last week, took so many notes. I mean, your TED Talk has 22 million views. And most of our guests are kind of in that range, but I just want to stop there. I mean, I don't have a TED Talk, and it hasn't had 22 million views. Why do you think, you're, why do you think you've hit a nerve? I think that people focus a lot upon success, our society does, and we keep thinking that if once I'm successful, then I'll naturally be happier. And what we're finding is that all these business leaders and chief learning officers and CEOs and, and parents that you know thought if they got to some place within their life at some sort of success level, then they'd find happiness. Or that the, if they surrounded their kids with all these good opportunities, that of course their kids would be happier. And what we were finding was that that wasn't occurring, that success wasn't yielding the levels of happiness that we expected. We were actually not seeing the correlations we, we thought we were gonna find at all. What I found in my research was exactly the opposite. We keep thinking if I work harder, I'll be more successful and then I'll feel happier. And it turns out our brains are designed so that every time we have a success, we change the goalpost what success looks like, right? Yeah. That's, that's why we don't stop the very first time 
we put a Lego together as at four years of age and be like, yeah, I'm done. That was it. I put Legos together. I'm successful. We want to see what our brains are capable of. The problem is that if happiness is on the opposite side of success, we never get there. And I think more and more people are starting to realize that within their lives. And they're like, okay, now what? What really creates happiness? And what we were finding was that the formula was the, the reverse way, that if you could raise someone's levels of happiness or optimism in the midst of stress, it turns out every single business and educational outcome would improve. So happiness did yield higher levels of success, but success didn't yield higher levels of happiness. And I think, I think that just hit a lot of nerve for a lot of people who have been struggling to find happiness in their lives. Sean Wells said, one of the premises of your most recent book, Big Potential, is that big potential like genius, creativity, and inspiration is not something you have but rather it's something you tap into. Talk a bit about that in the context of an organization and a team and a division. Defend that, if you will. Yeah, so with the happiness advantage and with the TED Talk, which is what I'm known for, that was all about how if we can change your individual habits, your happiness score improves, and then your business and educational outcomes improve as well. What was masked in all that research when I first doing was started doing that was how much of our happiness and success is actually interconnected with the ecosystem of potential around us. It turns out that our potential and happiness wasn't just something that we have, it was something we had to tap into with that ecosystem of potential. So I actually start the book with two stories that I think became the, the backbone of the work that I've been doing with companies ever since. Um, one of them was, uh, my father studied the neuroscience of perception for three decades at Baylor. And we didn't know any of this at the, at the time because um, perception is usually kind of a boring part of psychology. But these two researchers discovered that if you're looking at a hill, an obstacle you need to climb in front of you, if you look at that hill by yourself, your brain architects it, shows you a picture of a hill that is 10 to 20% steeper than the hill that your brain sees while standing next to someone who's going to climb that hill with you. That should not be happening, right? The hill is not changing. I thought that if I saw an obstacle, I know exactly how tall it is and whether or not I can overcome it. it. turns out that's not the way the human brain works. What we're finding is that the inclusion of somebody else on that journey with you changes the obstacle your brain sees. And now we know it's not just the physical ones, it's the emotional ones as well. Leading a team that's scattered across the globe, leading a team in the midst of challenges you're seeing in the political and economic environment, trying to get out of depression and anxiety while caring for aging parents or sick kids while trying to be successful at work. What we're finding is that those challenges are in flux based upon whether or not we think we're with somebody else or we think we're alone, which is why happiness can't be self-help, right? As soon as we put all those books you're describing and uh, uh, all these happiness books in the self-help section of a Barnes & Noble, we make happiness 10 to 20% steeper for people to achieve because they think they have to do it alone. When the greatest predictor of long-term levels of happiness at an organization is your social connection score. Yeah. It's the breadth, depth, and meaning in your social relationships. So I, we need others if we're actually going to find happiness, which led to a, a, a story that has become the metaphor for everything about big potential. And it's my favorite one, so I just wanted to share it. But uh, it's where I start the book, which is uh, these research, researchers were looking at lightning bugs. This is at MIT. They were looking at lightning bugs. Um, and lightning bugs and fireflies across the globe light up individually and randomly. And you chase them with your kids and they disappear and you chase another one. Um, but in two places in the globe, these species have figured out, as lightning bugs, have figured out how to time their pulses with the entire community. So the entire community of lightning bugs lights up and goes dark at the exact same time. Um, when they first discovered this, biologists thought it was actually impossible. They didn't believe the research because the whole point of lighting up, uh, being a lightning bug is to light up in the dark to increase your chances and success rate at reproduction. So why in the world would you light up when your competition's lit up? This is the same thing we see at companies as well, right? Where like, why would you, I want to enhance somebody else around me? They're in competition for the promotion I'm looking for, for the sale. So, uh, but what they found was that uh, when lightning bugs light up individually and randomly, their success rate of reproduction is 3% per night, which is still really good. But it turns out that in these two places in the globe where they light up together, as an interconnected community, the success rate goes from 3% to 82% per bug. It's not like one bug does really well with the new <laughs> system. The entire system is doing orders of magnitude better than we thought was possible because we thought we knew how the world worked, right? We thought it was survival of the fittest and it's actually survival of the best fit 
with the ecosystem of potential around us, which to bring this away from fireflies and back to um, the people that are listening to, to humans, unless there are some fireflies listening, I, is that, and watching is that, uh, you know, Google did the same thing. I know you know about Project Aristotle at Google where they were looking to see if they could measure your individual traits on teams. They thought if, if we can measure the individual traits, then we can find out who the superstars are. You put superstars on a team together and then you have superstar teams and you just replicate that hiring practice across the globe. They did a study with over 100,000 different employees. At the end of it, one of the researchers told me, we're Google, we're amazing at finding patterns. There is no pattern in the data. There is no pattern connecting the individual traits with the success rate of the team, which is stunning. That goes against everything we've learned about hiring and educating and training. And what we were finding was that the only thing that was predictive was the social cohesion on the team. It's, uh, do you like the people you work with? Do you have the psychological safety to voice your opinion? And can you connect your strength to the rest of the team? When that occurred, the success rate skyrocketed just like we saw with the fireflies. So what we're looking for is how do we actually find a way of lighting up together in the darkness in these communities and in, in the midst of a constantly changing world. Sean, I'm gonna have you revisit this idea that happiness isn't a choice, right? It's um, an interconnected one. Speak to everyone that's listening at, at some level in an organization and they're struggling with this tension, right, of being a good team player and lifting others and turning the spotlight while at the same time wanting to have the success of your own promotion and standing out. I mean, not every organization is Franklin Covey, right? Where we have a very strong culture, we have our own issues. But you know, in the, in, in the competitive world, the person who stands out is often getting the credit, the promotion, the raises, and the opportunities. What advice would you give to people not to be a Pollyanna, but also recognize that your happiness, if you're looking for that, does come from you know, interconnection? So it's a great question. Um, so I got the opportunity to meet up with coach Pete Carroll from the Seattle Seahawks uh, mm -hmm. last year. And I wanted to see what he was doing because he was using a lot of these positive strategies with his team, just wasn't using the positive psychology language. And I met up with him and he read the Firefly study that I just described. And he said, you know, that makes so much sense because the number one college football player every year, the Heisman Trophy winner, almost never does well when they go pro, um, which is crazy The the very best player we believe in college, and then they can't replicate those successes in the NFL every time. Um, and he said the reason for it is they're usually a quarterback or a running back, and they don't, when they get drafted, they don't bring their line with them. What that meant was that they didn't get to bring the teammates who are actually responsible for a lot of the successes that they were actually having. It's the same thing we saw on Wall Street. We see these financial analysts um, that were star analysts. Um, that's what they called them in the study. And they're the people you want to be because they just knock it out of the park all the time. We just assume that they're financial geniuses and we want to be like that person. Um, but so we watch them and then these researchers look to see what happened when they go to another company. And it turns out when they go to another company, it turns out only 30% of them over the next five year period of time are able to even replicate the successes from the previous organization. 70% of them drastically underperform. What the reason for that is, they didn't get to bring their line with them. Yeah. What I think this means is that you can be a superstar, you just can't be a superstar alone. And that we need to find a way of being able to enhance other people around us so that we can actually find and see more of our potential as well. The more that we think that we can diminish other people's lives or that we can do this all on our own, we're actually masking the majority of the potential that we're actually seeing with these within these environments. So what we're trying to do more and more is get people to deepen their social connection. Because what we're finding is not only is happiness the greatest predictor of long-term levels of uh, happiness, or, or, uh, social connection, when you have social connection, deepens your levels of happiness, but it turns out it's actually one of the greatest predictors of our success rate. I mean, that's uh, Project Aristotle as well. Like, if you want a team to perform at the highest possible levels, we need to invest in the happiness of the team that's there. So if happiness is related to social connection, we need to find a way of tapping into that. Because the previous research that we were doing on happiness showed incredible how incredible the advantage is when a brain is positive. When your brain is positive, your brain is 31% more productive than your brain at negative neutral yeah, stress. Sure. Your likelihood of promotion rises by 40%. Um, same level of stress, this is the research I did at UBS in the middle of the banking crisis, same level of stress, but you get somebody to have a positive mindset about that stress, you have a 23% drop in the negative effects of stress upon your job effectiveness, burnout, and fatigue. Um, what we're finding, literally, Every business outcome we know how to test for rises dramatically when the human brain is positive. 
I worked with insurance companies. We raised the levels of happiness on their team and the entire team's success rates rose by 50%. The revenues increased by 50% over the next 18 month period of time. The top 10% of optimists at, uh, uh, in one of the studies at a large insurance company outsold the other 90% by another 89%. What we're finding is happiness is an incredible advantage. It's just our happiness erodes very quickly as soon as we feel like we're alone because those challenges start to loom larger and also meaning comes from one another. So if we're not actually investing in the people around us, we're actually missing out on the majority of happiness within our own lives. Sean, this is a guess, but I, um, having been in this uh, personal development industry for nearly 30 years now, uh, four at the Disney Company and 24 here at Franklin Covey, I have seen countless numbers of high-performing individuals inside of firms, not just ours, but others, spin out to do their own thing. And few of them are rarely successful at the level that they think they're going to become. Superstars inside organizations move out and they have some modicum of success, but not like they thought they would, or they get depressed and they return back into organizations. It could be, it could be because of skills or financing, but I think it's, it's what you said earlier. Like me, when I was the chief marketing officer, we had an amazing run here. And I think, I'm not sure I could get a job as a chief marketing officer and be as successful because it was the team. It was Mike and Jen and Jimmy and Todd and Amber and Brandon and Lori and Matt and that whole team. I'm gonna guess that's um, a bit of wisdom to share when people do spin out. Are there any bits of insight you might give to say, and here's how you keep the momentum going when the line isn't taken with you? Um, I think there's two things. One of them is, um, I keep saying that social connection predicts your long-term levels of happiness. It's actually perception of social connection. So you could be surrounded by all those incredible people you just described, a phenomenal team, and you can miss it. You can miss seeing how incredible they are or how important they are to your successes. Mm -hmm. And you're missing out on social connection because social connection is defined as the breadth, the depth, and the meaning in your social relationships. So an extrovert might have great breadth, but they might not have the same depth or meaning that they feel within those relationships. Mm -hmm. Or I might be surrounded by a thousand people at work in a large company, but feel very alone while I'm doing this. Whereas you could have a small team, but feel deeply connected to them in the midst of this. So if somebody's going to a new place or even where they are, um, one of the most powerful things, I, you know, I look for these, I, when I first started doing this, I wanted these big organizational changes to make it companies. And if I could do that, then I, could, I felt like I could really help people. I'm finding that the things that I'm doing that seem to be helping the most when we research it are the smallest things possible. Like we're looking for two minute positive habits that people could do that change the way that their teams and they look at the world. I'll give you two examples. Um, one of them is one of the most powerful ones is we use technology. We get people every day. I, let me preface this by saying one thing that I've been thinking about. Um, if people believe the things we were just describing, and you've seen this over the past 30 years, if people believe that a positive mindset and happiness leads to greater levels of success, if you believe that portion of the research, then the very next question you need to be asking yourself right now is, what work routines am I doing to raise the levels of happiness for myself and my team before we do our work? Right? Because if you don't have anything in there, you're defaulting to whatever the genes or the environment are giving you in that moment, and you're underperforming your brain's capabilities. So one of the things we looked at was we go out to all these companies that are like, hey, we're, you know, we're very successful. Uh, we work with hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not part of our culture to sit around holding hands and talking about things we're grateful for. Um, so you know, that, that might work at a softer company, but not ours. So we went out to a level one trauma hospital to research to see if these ideas were actually work. We went out to Orlando Health and at every single one of their staff meetings, we got each person in the room to say one thing that they were grateful for to start their meetings. They're doing life or death decisions. These are grizzled veterans who've been doing this for 10 to 20 years, jaded by the fact that people live and die based upon their resource allocation. We had to get the CEO involved, the senior leaders had to be involved, the people that were new coming into the team, all of this, they had to they had to buy it. We burned all, all of our social capital to do this. Uh, it was one of our biggest successes to get them to do this for two weeks in a row. And two weeks after they started, a few people were like, why are we still doing it? That happiness guy's gone. And they said, no, this is part of our culture. We mm -hmm. believe we are more successful when we're linked together around something positive. And so when new people would come into the team, they would leave their team from their old organization and come to learn about this culture, they would start their meetings with one thing each person was grateful for. Now it sounds very soft. They said, if you come into the meeting, already have something you're grateful for because we have to go as fast as possible to get to our real work. The reason I'm telling the story is, is one of the places we were researching. We did this for two years at Orlando Health and almost two years to the day we started this, the Pulse nightclub shooting occurred three blocks away from them. 
the second largest shooting in US history. Um, you never hear this in the news, but the victims of that tragedy came to an organization that for two years have been using gratitude to rewrite the social scripts on their teams to increase their levels of resilience and social cohesion. They were trying to find a way of lighting up together in the dark. And the very next morning after the worst tragedy that their community experienced, they started their staff meetings with gratitudes because that's their culture. And the CEO said, uh, the president said it was, it was universal. Um, that they were so grateful that they hadn't wasted the last two years just working with the people that they worked with. Hmm. I think this directly relates back to your idea, whether or not you're on a new team or you're with a team that you've had in the past. It's so easy to just think, if I get my work done with this team, then I'll feel happier. Once we hit our goals, once we hit our financial targets, then we're going, we'll start talking about happiness. Just get our work done, or maybe hmm. I'll talk about happiness hmm. at home. When we do that, hmm. we dramatically underperform our capability and we don't get to see the large, um, we don't get to see our big potential. That big potential is what we see when only interconnected with the, the ecosystem around us. That hospital, when they go out to teach other hospital systems how to deal with the unthinkable, they start with gratitude exercises because they realize that gratitude was the glue that kept people together and is now one of the greatest predictors of long-term resilience for a team that we know. I just actually, in January, went out and worked with six battalions of Marines out at Camp Pendleton. I was invited out there by Colonel Rideout and he had me talk to these Marines and we were talking about gratitude exercises. And the second thing we did was the, the other part I was gonna tell you about a practical way to do this. The other thing we told the Marines was not only start your day thinking of three new things you're grateful for or to start your meetings with one thing each person in your unit was grateful for. Um, we also got them every day to start their day by writing a two minute positive text message or email praising or thanking one person in their life. You do this for 21 days in a row, you try and think of a new person each day, you'll think you'll run out of people around day eight. But then your brain has to start scanning for all those other people your brain has been missing. Those mentors that got you to where you are, all those people you just mentioned on your team that made you so successful, mm -hmm. um, you start writing to all of them, right? Not just to our family members and friends. Uh, you write to high school English teachers and coaches and friends and neighbors and friends you haven't seen for two or three years or people that believed in you a decade ago and that's why you're, you are where you are. When you write that, those people light up on your mental map of social connection. And if you do it for 21 days in a row, your social connection score moves up to the top 20% of people worldwide, which is amazing because social connection is the greatest predictor of not only your success and resilience, but your team's success and resilience as well. Uh, Sean, a sobering story about the Pulse nightclub and Orlando Health. Thank you for sharing that, reminding us of that. Uh, I balance that, that I love the fact that you're referred to as the happiness guy. That's a nice moniker, right? <laughs> but something that struck me in that story as well is this idea of, well, I'll be happy if I just, and I'll be happy when I get. I think a lot of high performers like me, we do this. We like to set goals for ourselves, right? I'll be happy when I get to Maui on vacation or when this bill is paid or when the tuition, you know, whatever it is, right? We set these goals for ourselves, and it's motivating in terms of some form of success, but it could be artificially prolonging or diminishing our happiness. What advice would you give for people like me that like to set goals and attach triumph or happiness or success to them, but it's kind of always elusive. So we, we, we have the benefit of achieving our goals but perhaps the, the happiness is just vacant. Yes, I, I've struggled with that as well because I think um, it's how I've motivated myself in the past. I love to set goals. I set tons of goals. People say don't set New Year's resolutions. I love New Year's resolutions. Like I get really, I, my success rate's low with them, but I set like tons of them at the beginning of the year. I love the idea of potential and growth. Um, all I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to make people less successful. I actually want to increase our chances of success at it. I'm just trying to switch around where happiness fits in the formula. Because I thought in the past, I'll use it as a carrot to try and get me to the next level. When really that happiness is the fuel to get my brain to that next level. Because what we know is the greatest competitive advantage in the modern economy is a positive and engaged brain. So if I can find some way now in the midst of achieving that goal of raising my levels of happiness and success, my likelihood of hitting there rises dramatically. So if I'm excited about hitting goals, I need to be talking about happiness now in, in the present. Um, we see that we see this so often where we're like, oh, you know, like once once I get into a good school, then I'll feel happier. Once I get a job, then I'll feel happier. Once I get a promotion, then I'll feel happier. Once I get married, then I'll feel happier. 
I remember that one, right? Or once I have kids, <laughs> have kids. Happy, right? <laughs> Each one of those moments, we think happiness will come. So I would say, look back at your life, even take this research away and say, are you automatically happier today? Is happiness easy because of those previous successes? Hmm. Um, I think pride comes from those and the resilience and willingness to be able to keep going. All that comes from uh, those successes. But being able to find happiness right now is only partly related to those externals. Um, what we're finding, though, is if we deepen our optimism, gratitude, or social connection, our success rates rise dramatically. So the question then becomes, what habits are we doing? What are we doing in our life to raise our levels of happiness now so we can hit those goals? Real quick example, I was working with a large automotive company, and they set their industry standards for this team uh, 30% beyond what the industry standards were. So they were trying to really push their team to be incredibly successful. They had one of those big, hairy, audacious goals you're supposed to do. And they set it, and they worked all year long at this breakneck speed, and the people were dropping out because of sickness, and they were fatigued, and they were uh, uh, team members would leave. It was just too much. But at the end of the year, they said December 26th, they actually hit their goal. But everyone was away for the, for the holidays. And then they started back at 0% on January 1st, starting over again. So if we're not celebrating those successes, if we're not automatically finding happiness, if we you know, start each quarter with new sales targets and goals, I speak at so many companies and they, they outline all their financial goals and things that they're setting for the next year. And they frame it as, we will be so happy five years from now once we get there. Um, but if you want top talent that's working at its highest possible level, we need to find a way of getting them to feel greater levels of meaning, happiness, joy, and purpose in the present. Well said. Uh, Sean, I want to spend some time at the end here to talk about the positive influencers concept. Before I go there, I love this quote from General Colin Powell, of which I'm a big fan, where he talks about perpetual optimism is in fact a force multiplier. When I read that and I read the passage, I struggled because... You know, I would like to be known as sort of an optimistic realist. I don't think I'm a pessimist. I don't think I'm an unbridled optimist. Bring some sanity to this idea around perpetual optimism being a force multiplier on teams that have big, hairy, audacious goals. They need to celebrate more, but they want to create momentum. What, what advice would you give leaders of teams on the role that optimism places or, or connects to with momentum? Uh, this is one of the questions I got out of Camp Pendleton. One of the Marines was like, we're supposed to detect for threats. So are you are saying be an optimist and just ignore all the threats that are going on in the world? I think we have a fundamental misunderstanding about not only what optimism is, but what happiness is. And I think it holds us back, especially in the corporate world in terms of leadership. Um, I gave a talk to a thousand safety inspectors and I felt like the talk went okay. And afterwards, this guy came up to me and was like, you know, you just spoke to a thousand pessimists. Our job is to find all the problems that are going to cost you millions of dollars and could threaten people's lives. That's our job. And I said, you know, I thought about what he was saying and seeing a problem doesn't make you a pessimist, right? Seeing a problem and thinking you can't fix that actually makes you a pessimist within that domain. I have people, I had a guy come up to me after a talk and say, you know, I like this, this research. I'm a pessimist and my wife's an optimist. Um, and it's good because we need both people in this relationship because somebody's got to see the problems. That's not what optimism and pessimism is. Both optimists and pessimists can equally see a problem in a product and a team and an economy and a child and ourselves, a weakness. Um, optimists and pessimists have equal ability to see a problem. It's once a problem has been perceived, then we find out whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist. The pessimist believes that problem is permanent and pervasive, it affects everything. The optimist believes it's local, it's one part of the reality, so they can still identify the good things going on and that it's temporary, they believe that their behavior will matter if linked to other people around them. So what I'm going for, you know, I gave a talk out at a large software company and the CEO offered to drive me to the airport afterwards. And he was in this fancy car and he was speeding all over the road and I was holding on for dear life for when I got in the car with this guy. And uh, that seatbelt bell was going off in his car for a while and then it got tired, it turned off. And I was like, you don't wear seatbelts? He said, no, Sean, I listened to your talk. I love your research. I'm an optimist too and just kept driving. <laughs> I was like, no, you're crazy, um, but I'd love to work with you. But optimism, you know, uh, that's irrational optimism. It gives happiness a bad name. Yeah. It makes us feel like I have to ignore and turn a blind eye to the negative going on in the world or on a team or in my life in order to find happiness. Mm -hmm. Irrational optimism gives happiness a bad name. And people stop believing in your leadership and your advice and your parenting because they believe you're divorced from reality. 
Yeah. What I'm arguing for is not irrational optimism. Right. What I'm arguing for is what sociologists call rational optimism, which does not start with rose-colored glasses. It doesn't start with a sugarcoating of the world. It starts with realism, a realistic assessment of where the economy is or where your team is or where you are. But in the midst of the realism, you maintain the belief that eventually my behavior will matter if linked to the right people. When we have that type of approach, we avoid those two pitfalls of either trying to turn a blind eye to the problems and not fixing them, or seeing the problems and getting paralyzed by them. The rational optimists can actually see the problems but believe that they can do something about it, and they're the ones who become the most successful. Sean, our time is ending soon, but I want to save time for positive influencers. I would be remiss if I didn't have a chance to hear about your experience with Oprah. So you were invited to Super Soul Sunday, the most influential programming, I think, on television. Take a few moments and recreate for our listeners and viewers what it was like to meet Oprah, your conversation. What did you learn from her? You talk about it in the book, but I want to have you share it on today's podcast. Um, it's actually become really important to the research story uh, for a very specific reason. So it happened that, uh, you know, I was traveling too much. I, I was giving about 90 to 100 talks a year. Um, and my wife, who was pregnant at the time, said, you can't go anywhere in February when our sons could be born unless, like, Oprah calls. And then three days later, her team called. <laughs> and uh, I was like, amazing, Michelle, say somebody else also. And then uh, three days after Leah was born, I found myself in the backyard of her house talking about happiness research out of Montecito, California for the show, which I, I agree with you, is one of the best shows on television. And um, I had never met a celebrity at that point. I thought I'd be normal, <laughs> I wasn't at all. She had this redwood forest on her property, as one does, and you walk through it and you <laughs> see her for the first time. And they have three camera crews filming this beautiful and organic first meeting with Oprah. And my brain just turned off. I was like, nope, I'm out. And uh, she was like, Sean, Sean, Sean. And I didn't know the protocol, like Oprah, Oprah, Oprah. So I said nothing, uh, but I saw her hands were up. So I. I, uh, I thought we were doing a high five. Then we started grabbing each other's hands and these clawed and we started rotating in a circle. Almost twice, they had to shut off the cameras for the first time in a thousand interviews. <laughs> if you ever see that episode where I see her for the first time, that was the second time because I screwed it up so badly. <laughs> but the reason I want to tell you that is the next minute later, she makes you feel so comfortable you'll tell her anything. So it's an amazing week. I'm with Oprah, talking about happiness. My son's been born. And I turned to her and said, I'm so disappointed with this interview. I really was hoping we'd have time to talk about going through depression because it's so easy to hear all this research and be like, yeah, of course he's happy. You know, he's a happiness researcher, right? His wife's a happiness researcher. If you see my TED talk, my sister's a unicorn. And uh, of course, Oprah's happy. Take all the problems you're thinking about trying to solve this week and then just add in all of her wealth and celebrity friends in a private chat. Um, Got to be easy to be happy if you're Oprah. And she said, I went through two years. She said, I went through two years of depression at the height of my career while making the most money when beloved didn't do as well as I wanted to and I shattered and didn't want to go on living. Um, so if success at that altitude doesn't work, why do we assume it's automatically gonna work once we get the next promotion or bonus? But I turned around and said, I went through two years of depression while I was at Harvard, teaching the freshmen how not to go through depression themselves. She turned back on the cameras. We did a whole second interview, a whole second hour that was so much deeper than the first. Talking about how do you restart forward progress. And you're right, I think that's a great way to end this is because the turning point for me was big potential. Up to that point, I was so good at checking off individual metrics in my life, like tests and like everyone watching this, and listening to this feels the same way. So when I got depressed, I was like, I can solve this myself. I don't need one to help. I'll read a book about it and then I'll be there for other people, but I'll solve this. And I went deeper and deeper and deeper into depression. The turning point is I had to turn to my eight closest friends and family and say, I've been going through depression for two years. I have no idea how to get out of this, but I really need your help. The groundswell of support from the people I was working with and my friends and family was amazing. They were calling me, meeting up with me, emailing me, bringing me cupcakes. But as soon as I told them what I was going through, as soon as I opened up to people that were sometimes my competitors in that environment, it turns out that that hill of overcoming depression in front of me dropped by 10 to 20%. Because I'm not climbing that hill alone, I'm now perceiving it with somebody who's climbing it with me. And they start opening up as well. Turns out, instead of trying to light up individually and randomly in a hyper-competitive environment, we start to try and light up together. And it deepened not only these social bonds, but it's the reason I do this research now, trying to bring this out to, to companies. And I'm working with all the schools in Flint, Michigan right now to try and raise levels of happiness. Um, what we're finding is that this research really matters and that change is possible. Sean, such a great story. Uh, the book is very aspirational. It's also extremely practical. Midway through, you talk about three types of positive influencers everyone can use in their life. Pillars, bridges, and extenders. Would you take just a half a minute on the role that pillars, what they are, 
and how the value they play in your life. So pillars are people that will love you regardless. And we need those because so much of our time we think I will be happy when all these people like me mm. on social media, right? Or as soon as I get enough listeners or enough people to buy this book. Um, it turns out that doesn't work at all. I've completely changed the way I do social media because I was finding that like I was spending so much time trying to feel loved and it always backfires. Either I don't get enough likes or somebody else like a cat video gets like 60 million views, right? Um, so what we're finding was you had to start with the pillars. Those are the people that regardless of what's going on in your external world will be there for you. Uh, then you have the bridge individuals. Those are the ones who will connect you to other uh, networks. They're outside your normal sphere of influence or your ecosystem. So changing the people that you listen to, changing the diversity of the uh, people that are in your inner circle, which changes then how much of your ecosystem is actually being mm -hmm. um, uh, improved by that biodiversity, if you want to call it that. And then uh, the extenders, these are the people that make you grow. They push you out of your comfort zone to allow you not to stay where you are, but actually push you to see what your brain is capable of. The book is worth just this chapter alone for people. Sean Acor, author of Big Potential, numerous books on happiness, friend of Oprah, 20 plus million views on TED Talks. What's next for you? Um, I'm taking all this work that I'm doing with the companies and I'm trying to take the money I earned from it and pump it into a nonprofit so that we can get it out to the schools. We're working with 85 school districts across the country, taking the same positive psychology research we've been using at companies around this parable I wrote, I wrote called the orange frog. And now we're bringing it in schools and we're, we're dropping their depression rates by nearly 30%. We're raising their test scores to the top 2% of the nation. We've got kids in the poorest county in Iowa um, now kids from the richer counties are now coming to the poorest county in Iowa to get a better education. What we're finding is that this stuff works everywhere, not just in the business world. This works in our families and schools as well. So I get really excited about that. Sean, thanks for your time today. Look forward to having you back on your next book. Love to hear about the progress in Iowa and Flint as well. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, it's been our honor. Pick up a copy of Sean Acor's newest book, Big Potential, How Transforming the Pursuit of Success Raises Our Achievement, Happiness, and Well-Being. Thanks for joining us today. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, do so by visiting franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership button. Subscribe comes out every Tuesday via email and a newsletter. You can also consume it on your favorite podcast channels. We're everywhere, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes. Rate us, rank us, review us. And we'll see you back here next week for our next guest on Franklin Covey's On Leadership.